let me say first of all that this talk is nothing to do with the Scottish referendum or the triumph of the SNP at the last election or the possible future complexion of a Scottish Parliament. I have two very good friends who have spoken about Scottish affairs here before and I neither want to condone or contradict them. And I have another very close friend who has, since he knew the title of this speech, been sending me information that I should tell the English. <laughs> but I have no intention of doing that because it would be in 1972 that I became slightly embarrassed by some of my fellow country people. It was on a bus going from Shaftesbury Avenue to Balls Pond Road, a number 38, and I was on the upper deck, as were several other people. And at the front of the upper deck, this man suddenly stands up and says, Who was it who gave you your television? A Scotsman. And who is it who gave you your steam engine? A Scotsman. And who is it that gave you your pacemakers? A Scotsman. And then somebody from the back of the bus says, And who is it who gave you your whiskey? And, <laughs> and the whole bus shouted a Scotsman. <laughs> but I want to speak about England as someone who has worked in this country and as someone who visits this country, probably spending about three months a year in England. Indeed, in the last two years, I reckon that I've worked in 90% of the English counties including the peripherals like Cornwall and Cumbria and the exotics like Rutland. <laughs> so I see a bit of this country and my observations here are more on my own experience than on any reading. Although I did read two books in advance, one Jeremy Paxman's The English and the other an American woman called Sarah Lyle who wrote a book called The Anglophiles. And I want to do occasionally a little bit of biblical uh, reflection where that is pertinent. But in no way am I going to try to prove or disprove that these feet in ancient times did walk upon England's mountains green. <laughs> the first time I came to England was in 1962. It was simply with my family to pass through en route to Germany and to, to stay with a German couple who had befriended my father when he was in the army at the end of the war. It was a long journey by train, boat and train, but thankfully broken by my uncle in London, taking us for breakfast to an establishment near, near Euston Station. And all I remember was wondering why there were so many black people who were waiters and who were cleaners, but only white people who were handling the cash in the large cafeteria. In 1971, I came back to work in London a year previously, the Seaboam report reorganised social services in England so that social work became generic, welfare, um, mental health and children's work all under the one roof. And to assess the need, Islington Borough Council had sent a questionnaire to every household asking people if they needed guide dogs or, or uh, radios for the blind or home helps. And the response was so overwhelming that they had to go to community service volunteers to find people um, who had some pastoral experience who could help out to respond to this incredible re re reply about the questionnaire asking what, by way of welfare or social aid, had to be offered. So all day I spent uh, time in a social work office and visiting people, and at night I helped out in a local authority hostel for delinquent boys who were there either by court order or because their parents couldn't look after them. And I remember wondering why, so disproportionately, most of these boys were uh, uh, Anglo-Caribbean or were Asian. Islington at that time had not been gentrified. Blair had not moved in. I saw incidents of poverty and neglect which would match anything I saw thereafter in the developing world. And I saw evidence of racial tension and discrimination which bore some comparison with the sectarian divisions at that time within Glasgow. And in no small way, the poverty and discrimination were the legacy of empire, of which England and London in particular were the epicenters. The Queen was no longer called the Empress of India, 
but most school maps in the 1970s still bore a quarter of the globe at least painted pink. British colonies and protectorates, in many of which English was the lingua franca, the dominant language. Now, when you have an empire as big as Britain had, and there was none bigger in imperial status, there are two things you need. One is an army of military people and administrators to look after this vast enterprise. And the other is the support of people at home who are willing to let their sons and their daughters go abroad in service of the empire. And one way of discouraging that, of encouraging that, is and will be seen again this year at the last night of the proms, when a fairly substantially busted female will come to the front of the platform and sing the ditty, when Britain first at heaven's command. Now, I don't know much about oceanography, but I don't think that Britain was necessarily the first island to come from out the Asian main. But even if it were, this was the charter, the charter of the land, and guardian angels sang the strain. Now, from our understanding of guardian angels in the Bible, it's usually the sanctus that they sing. Holy, 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 not rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. <laughs> but these songs and others which were written peculiarly in the late 18th and early 19th century were to get people behind the empire. They displaced folk songs, particularly in the major English cities, and they became national songs, which made us feel, in England particularly, that Britain was great and was chartered by God to dominate the globe. And then there also were statues, and, and this is the only quote I'm taking from Paxman's book. The public face of our national culture, and here he's speaking of England, is overwhelmingly imperial and royal, grandiose and triumphal commemorations of military victories, self-sacrifice, and violent death. There are no monuments between Victoria Station via Buckingham Palace and along the Mall to Waterloo Place dedicated to civic culture or intellectual life. There are no statues to philosophers or writers as there are scattered through pa Paris. It's, it's those who were our military leaders and those particularly who expanded the empire. But there is another consequence of empire, and that is that there might one day be payback time when people who have been our subjects want to become one of us. When people who have been led to believe that we are the epicenter of democracy want to come and try it out for themselves. When people who have been evangelized and led in the hottest of summers to believe that Jesus was born in a snowdrift, when they want to visit the mother church of Methodism or Anglicanism or the Salvation Army or the Presbyterians, when people want to have a stake in the country which at one time controlled their economy, governed their land and imported their produce at favorable terms to the importers tobacco from Jamaica, chocolate from Ghana, cotton from India, cheap toys and trinkets from Hong Kong, coffee from Kenya, tea from Sri Lanka, rubber from Malaysia. Well, in the 50s and 60s, people came from these places because we needed them. There was at that time a thing called the 10 pound ticket, which many people in Britain took up, and it let them emigrate from Britain to Australia, New Zealand, and to Canada, but particularly Australia. And I was brought up in what was then called a council housing scheme, now it's a social housing scheme, where there were 52 um, houses in the street and one in six people in the 60s went from there to Australia or to Canada. In the 1970s, when I was in London, others fleeing persecution in former colonies were among those who I met. I remember my first meeting with Asian people face to face were Ugandan Asians who had fled to Britain because of the persecution of Idi Amin. And now in 2015, they still come and still want to come from Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Syria, perhaps because we, in consort with another imperial power, have destabilized their nations. <laughs> 
It seems to me to be very ironic that we don't mind having our army occupy Afghanistan or Iraq or our Air Force bomb Syria, but if the innocent victims look to us for sanctuary, they can only wave from the other side of the channel. At the moment, Germany... At the moment, Germany is taking in over a 1,000 asylum seekers per day. They will, by the end of the year, expect to take 800,000 people who are seeking asylum or refuge into their nation. Germany lost their empire a long time ago. And Germany has had much less engagement in the conflicts in the Middle East and in North Africa than we've had. And yet somehow we feel we have a right to absent ourselves from the consequences of our action. Maybe it's because we are an island, and like a snail, we can, repeat, we can retreat into our shell when it suits us. There's a seldom-read story in the book of Judges about a man called Jephthah, who was renowned as a warrior. And he was asked by the Israelites to lead them into a fierce battle. Before engaging with the enemy, he vowed to God that if he emerged victorious, he would slaughter the first creature that came to him when he returned to his farm, presuming it might be a calf or a lamb or a sheepdog or even a slave. As it happened, it was his daughter. So after accusing her of bringing misfortune on him, he killed her. It's an awful story, but it's perhaps indicative of how what you pray for might come with a cost. And in the past, the United Kingdom, as present in the USA, had people who prayed in words not dissimilar to the national song I quoted earlier, that God who made her mighty might make her mightier yet. Victory, especially imperial victory, comes with a cost. Those whom you have conquered have a memory and an experience of domination, and they have rights to reparation which need to be dealt with. It amazes me that in Canada and in Australia, the European settlers who at the moment are there realize that they have taken lands of people, have raped their culture, and have disenfranchised and separated people from the land which they can read. And yet in Britain, we have, and I'm including my own country, Scotland, we have gone all over the globe but because great numbers of us have not settled in Kenya or Malawi or in the parts of the Caribbean, we don't feel somehow the need that Canadians and Australians do to make reparation. Well, last year, the Caribbean politicians mooted the possibility of asking Britain to compensate both for the forced expatriation of its population from the west coast of Africa as slaves and for the natural wealth extracted from the land at minimal cost. And in June of this year, Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of British India, raised the same issue and praising a speech by an, an Indian parliamentarian in which that uh, man said, Britain's rise was financed by its depredations in India. We Indians paid for our oppression. It's a bit rich to torture and repress and then celebrate democracy at the end of it. And then he went on to argue that the principle of reparations should be accepted and acted on. I don't hear any voice within our parliament, whether that's the parliament in Edinburgh, Wales, the Assembly of Northern Ireland, or at Westminster, which is prepared to deal with this historical legacy. We were the imperial power. The profit from our enterprises built our great cities and filled our nation's coffers in the past. And one example is particularly pertinent, it will be next year, and that is Diego Garcia, which is a, an island in the Indian Ocean. It was an island which the French first occupied and they used it as a leper colony and then they put black slaves into that island. Britain took it over after the Napoleonic Wars. We won and we took that island and we administered it with slaves. And then in 1966, we bought uh, the kind of infrastructure on the island for a cost of three mi million uh, pounds from Mauritius. Uh, 
And round about the same time, we entered into a negotiation with the United States of America, who were looking for an Air Force base near Asia. And so Britain agreed that they could have for 50 years the island of Diego Garcia as their Asian Air Force base. And in return, no money changed hands, but we were given $14 million of Polaris submarines. In 1971, all those who were native to that land, who'd been, who, whose ancestors had been slaved, slaves who were brought up in it, around 1,600 people were forcibly, forcibly expatriated by the United Kingdom and sent to the Seychelles and to Mauritius. And the Americans used that as a place where, among other things, extraordinary rendition took place. These people deserve reparation. And pray God that next year, in 2016, we don't allow another 20 years of American presence to happen there, but we allow the indigenous natives to be repatriated. And when our prime ministers talk about how the people in the Falkland Islands should decide their destiny, I want to know why the people in Diego Garcia were never asked if they could decide their destiny. But back to England, and back particularly to London. London is a unique city in a multitude of ways. It has the dual role as capital of England of also being the capital of the United Kingdom. And as the capital city, it has one of the largest percentages of the population living in its near vicinity of any world capital. Greater London has almost one in six of the population of the United Kingdom. This is true of no other European capital. And as the capital city, it is the headquarters of the government, of lawmaking, of banking, and of tourism. And it's within an hour's traveling distance of the two most renowned world universities, Oxford and Cambridge. I cannot think of any other country where there's a city which has so much by way of influence and power as its capital city. In France, many folk bypass Paris to visit the Mediterranean coast. Likewise, with Madrid, people go to the Spanish Riviera. The Hague in the Netherlands is not overrun with tourists. Washington DC is not the largest city in the USA and more banking and business is done in New York. The same is true of Pretoria in South Africa and Canberra and Australia is really a village compared to Sydney. From the outside, London looks like a highly privileged bubble in which those who are most privileged in terms of wealth get their own way and the less privileged have no recourse to justice. Take housing, for example. When I worked in London, most people rented accommodation from the local council or one of the many charitable trusts. And thus, people, as they grew up, could live in a locality with which they were familiar one of my friends who lives in Holborn grew up in the street where he now lives. And he's lived in that street now for 66 years. And he's lived in the house in which he was born, the tenancy of which he took over from his mother when she died. Because he's a long-term tenant, he has a controlled rent, which rises incrementally. He pays around £600 a month, for two rooms and a kitchen. But directly above him in the same building is a flat exactly the same size, which does not have a long-term tenant. In this flat with two rooms and a kitchen, the cost rises exponentially every time a tenant moves out. So upstairs at the moment, whereas he's paying 600 a month, upstairs they're paying 2,000 a month for the same accommodation. And anyone who has a son or a daughter or a friend who's working or studying in London knows how easily they become the victims of non-regulated housing policies. 
We'll remember last year the protest which Russell Brand became a part of against the proposed closure of a social housing project in order that it might be refurbished and relet with some accommodations having an affordable rent. The very term affordable appalls me. It implicitly suggests that other people will be paying unaffordable rents. We know that this process of denuding a local area of social housing has been going on since the days when Thatcher wanted us to become a property-owning democracy, something not espoused by Denmark, Sweden, Germany, all of which are successful countries and all of which have teachers and managers and clergy and lawyers living in rented houses at an affordable rent. In Germany, half the new homes built in 1990 were apartments. In England, the best estimate was about 15% in 1990. Two thirds of English people own their homes, which is almost twice the rate of owner occupation in Germany. Just three weeks ago, the Labour MP and London mayor, mayoral candidate, Sadiq Khan, indicated that under current government policy of allowing housing associations to sell to tenants and forcing local authorities to sell off their most valuable housing assets, London could lose up to 500,000, half a million affordable homes. Three months ago, when I was leading a retreat, I watched the 60s documentary, Cathy Come Home, which created fury throughout the United Kingdom and led, among other things, to the founding of the charity for the homeless called Shelter. It bears seeing again. It seems that London is going forward into the past. But when you have in London, which has always had visitors and transients, a new breed who are highly paid and expect to live there permanently, not only is the cultural and social fabric of the city skewed to meet their expectations, but the rest of the country has to deal with both the fallout and with the new trends being set. So people who no longer, and some people who retire in London, can no longer afford in the retirement to pay a rent, so they have to move to Luton or Sheffield and other parts of the country have to pick out the social detri detritus of, of the policies of, of, um, of, of London. And we are having the same thing in Scotland where Aberdeen has become our London and where money causes rents to go up, prices to go up and the ordinary people to become disenfranchised from the city in which they were born and which they love. It amuses me that in London people get a waiting allowance. Now this has got nothing to do with how heavy you are. <laughs> this has been going on for ages and I got it when I worked in London. It's an incremental increase in salary because of the higher costs of living in the capital. I wonder why people in the Western Isles or Orkney or Shetland don't get such a thing. Because unlike in London, if they and people in Cornwall have the same uh, difficulty, if they have to go to places where there are jobs for interviews or to a major hospital for treatment, it costs them to travel. I wonder why people in Cornwall don't get a waiting allowance. After all, if you live in London, you can get into the Tate for nothing. But if you go into the Corn Cornish version of the Tate Gallery, you have to pay about 10 pounds. Although it's a very <laughs> poor area. And a gentleman over here suggested that it was substandard work, which was on show. <laughs> It's in London that most of the banking scandals of 2008 developed. The fixing of the LIBOR rate, the selling of mortgages beyond people's ability to pay, the competition among bank workers to see who would take the biggest risks. But it's not those who live in the capital and those who engineer the crisis who pick up the tabs. It's everyone else who has to pay for the capital corruption. The financial sector particularly interests me because it trawls nationwide to get people to move from their home or their university to come to London. 
And they don't go primarily for economists or for business school graduates. They go for engineers. Every spring, final year engineering students at Strathclyde University, as elsewhere, are encouraged by starting salaries of £56,000 and above to come to London. These are people who've been pursuing so far the whole gamut of engineering, civil aviation, industrial, and they succumb to this very tempting offer. I discussed this earlier in the year when I was preaching in one of the Cambridge colleges. When I had dinner afterwards, I was sitting next to a distinguished professor of engineering, and I asked him why such a high proportion of engineering graduates end up in the City of London financial institutions. Well, he said, I've been concerned about this for some time. Some of my best postdoctoral students, some of my best postdoctoral students have succumbed to the temptation. I'm not sure why. Perhaps they are recruited because their training makes them unafraid of figures. Most people can deal with hundreds or thousands, maybe a million, but who feels comfortable distinguishing between 4.5 and 5.3 billion? These figures are beyond us. And then he said almost as an afterthought, of course, they might not have the same moral scruples as economists. Because if a financial institution says to an economist, we're thinking of making an investment in a particular part of Africa, buying over land to allow Sweden, Russia, other parts of the Northern Hemisphere to grow crops out of season, courgettes, strawberries, aubergine. An economist might say, well, that it would be a good investment, but Africa is a thirsty continent. And if you buy over or even rent this land to grow courgettes and strawberries, you need a lot of water and you're going to denude the water supply from the local inhabitants. But an engineer would not be thinking in that direction. He'd be looking as to whether it was a viable financial transaction. It seems that Cambridge, as distinct from Oxford, as regards acquiescing to the seduction of students by allurements offered by the financial sector, is slightly better. In recent research conducted by John Shell and George Monbiot, they asked the eight universities with the highest graduate salaries whether they sought to counter the lavish recruitment drives by the banks. Oxford said, but isn't it preferable that the city recruits bright critical thinkers and socially engaged graduates who are smart enough to hold their employers to account when possible? I mean, this is a bit like saying, it's preferable to have grossly obese people running sweet shops because they might discourage the consumers from overindulging. It's a failure of logic. But the head of the career service at Cambridge was reported as sending out regular emails telling students, if you don't want to become a banker, you're not a failure. And he even runs an event called, I don't want to work in the city. Just out of interest, when a month ago, there was the first prosecution of a banker who had rigged the LIBOR rate to his own personal gain, for which he was awarded 14 or 15 years in prison. He was an engineering graduate. The whole issue of finance and honest dealing is a light motif in the Bible. Whether it's in the law where people are told not to cheat their fellow citizens, or the prophets which talk about false scales in the merchant's hands, or the Psalms, which talk about how you should put no trust in extortion or false confidence in robbery or the books of wisdom or the gospels. The Bible speaks eloquently about clarity and responsibility with regard to the money we have and particularly other people's money and how the use of money can either enhance the welfare of a nation or can degrade people. But the banks are but one of four corridors which in London are part of a, or lead to a revolving door. You can go from Parliament to the bank if you get turfed out of your parliamentary constituency. And you may come from law to Parliament 
or go back to law when your time as an MP is over. And certainly, if you've been to Oxford or Cambridge, all exits and entrances are open. If I had the time to pay a researcher, I would love to know exactly how many graduates of Oxford and Cambridge hold positions of importance in the worlds of finance, the law, and the government. But recently, the Sutton Trust, which is a charity, did some work and discovered that Oxbridge graduates account for 82% of barristers, 78% of judges, 53% of top solicitors, 45% of leading journalists. And add to that the fact that 12 members of the cabinet and 12 members of the shadow cabinet are Oxbridge graduates. And you wonder whether democracy is not under threat in Britain. And this is not for a moment any attempt to degrade or to belittle the importance of universities of international distinction. But when their graduates are in control of some of the major areas of social and political and financial life, I don't know if that is perhaps the kind of balance which bodes well for the future. We know, and a report published on the 6th of August confirms this, that children who are the products of non-state schools have an inbuilt advantage. It's called the public school premium. It's an index of how those who have been privately educated consistently have higher levels of graduate pay than those who are state educated. But when on top of this you have the Oxbridge bonus, which predominates more in London than anywhere else, it would suggest to me that politics, finance, the law cannot but be biased in favour of the perspectives of those who are a privileged elite. It used to be in Scotland and in some parts of England that membership of the Freemasons benefited people in their business and careers. Now it's the ancient university tie. I believe that this hamstrings democracy, the more so when an increasing number of the political masterclass enter parliament with limited experience of life, but have, have come up either as graduates from university, preferably with a law degree, and then have become a researcher for a sitting MP, and then have been preferred for a vacant seat. The first politician I ever came into contact with was a man called William Ross, who was the MP for Kilmarnock, which is where I come from. And, some, and he was the MP, and then he became the Secretary of State for Scotland. And a lot of people still called him Major Ross, because before he was a politician, he'd been in the army. And one of the great distinctions about Willie Ross was that he could speak with people who were in social benefit, and he could speak to people who were the captains of industry with equal acceptance and sensitivity. And it's because he had had a life outside politics in the army and he had to mix with a whole range of people. And he brought that experience and that perspective of a life outside politics into Westminster, as happened with people who'd been in trade unions, people who'd been landed gentry, people who'd been farmers, people who'd been industry. But people nowadays would think, if you asked, who has an experience outside of Parliament? They would think of Alan Johnson. But he's really representative of a breed of politicians which are no longer. And it's sad that he is the exception. Now, I have no doubt that there are parliamentarians of great ability and distinguished reputation who have moved very quickly from a university exam hall to the government or opposition benches. One of them is Mary Black, and another would be her predecessor, Douglas Alexander. But to have the majority of the House not only a resident in London, but having little by way of extra political experience, is to promote doctrinaire discussion over informed debate and representation of the people. But what if England outside London? This interests me. Because in the past two or three years, whether it's been in Cornwall or Cumbria or Middlesbrough or Norwich, I've consistently heard people of whatever political complexion speak of how they wonder whether Westminster understands them. Some indeed have expressed an envy of Scotland and Wales, which have their own parliaments. When I think of Cornwall, I think of a small town called Paul Zeeth on the North Cornish coast. <laughs> 
Well, there's a stunning collaboration between a Christian surfers organization and the local Methodist church. It's a beautiful natural bay with great waves, ideal for surfing. But like much of Cornwall, it shows signs of poverty, unemployment, and homelessness. Cheek by jowl, with extravagant multi-million pound homes being built on cliffs facing the sea by wealthy Londoners who want a seaside pied a terre, gated preferably, which they have no intention of living in apart from weekends or holidays. When I think of Cumbria, I think last year of going round Maryport with the local rural dean. Again, an area of high unemployment. We passed a new private housing development which would have no benefit to local people where social housing provision is dangerously low. Why this new place is being built in a, an area of high unemployment was my question to the dean. And the priest replied that he had no idea. It must have been a government grant matched by the avarice of property speculators. In Birmingham, I spent the evening in the company of a recently appointed head of a primary school in which a third of the pupils don't live with both birth parents and over half have English as a second language. It had just been visited by Ofsted. The previous day, the inspectors had been in an affluent suburb where there was high motivation from parents, few discipline problems, and a fairly homogenous group of pupils. When they came to the inner city school, the criteria which they had extolled in the wealthy suburbs were clearly lacking. While the school was not put on special measures, some of the staff, whom the teacher the head regarded as his finest teachers, were. In Norwich, this is just by the by, I was speaking last year to the, diocese, the, 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 the diocese has this lovely event once a year when they bring in the head teachers from a whole range of dioceses and primary schools, and there's one secondary school. And, and they also feel as if you know, London and the powers that be within the education department don't understand what it's like to teach in a rural area. And I'd never been there before, and I don't often speak to people uh, who are in that profession. So when I began, I said, friends, I have two apologies to make. The first is that I am not a teacher. But then neither is Michael Gove, and that's my second apology. <laughs> well, <laughs> what I'm leading up to is that I believe that England is poorly governed and deserves better. Just think, England has a population of over 50 million people, and it only has half a parliament, because West Westminster has to deal with the four nations business as well as those which are peculiar to England on its own. Scotland has under five million people, but has its own parliament, as well as membership with Westminster. Now, compare this to the USA, 300 million inhabitants, and in addition to the legislature in Washington, D.C., there is a government for each of the 50 constituent states, a regional parliament on average for every six million people, ensuring that what is particular to the geography, the industry and the culture of that state is appropriately considered in the state assembly. Consider the German lander or the Swiss cantons, where people are proportionally represented in regional authorities, many of which have tax raising powers. Why are people in Cornwall, Cumbria, Birmingham and Norfolk vastly different localities governed by a Westminster London mentality. And let me say I am not swayed by the Chancellor's idea of a northern powerhouse. It seems to stop at Manchester. Now where is Newcastle? I listened to one of the radio programmes where it was suggested that there might be other regional groupings, but these seemed primarily to be based on economic expediency as if money mattered more than people. I'm highly suspicious of these moves for two reasons. The one is that it all seems very piecemeal. In Scotland, long before we had our own parliament, we had a constitutional convention, a process of, of the public discerning all through the country what would be the best way 
for Scotland to govern its own affairs and represent its people. The same should happen in England. There should be a measured consultative process with different options on the table. I don't trust the idea of a northern powerhouse and similar conglomerations because I think that all the Chancellor would do would be to vote a proportion of money to whatever the regional authority might be, inevitably less than would fulfil local aspirations, and when they failed to balance the books, then, as with failing schools and hospitals, that region would come under central control. It interests me immensely how a government which was elected in believing that local people should make local decisions should almost every other month indicate that Westminster will appropriate to itself local powers if the local authority does not do its bidding. We've seen that with schools and we see it with hospitals and the most recent case has to do with fracking. If a local authority, say in Lancashire, does not speedily give licenses, it will be overruled by the Department of Energy because fracking is seen as a major source of revenue and of, of fuel. I sometimes think that the Chancellor and some of his near cronies suffer from the Abimelech syndrome. I realise I've mentioned this man's name the past two times I've been speaking. And you might ask, well, who is Abimelech? Because he doesn't sound like a Westminster parliamentarian. No. He was one of 71 sons fathered by a man called Gideon, who in his spare time was a, a judge, one of the great judges over Israel. But unlike um, the, his 40 brothers, Abimelech had different loyalties because he was the illegitimate son of a concubine who his father occasionally consorted with. Whatever his sense of family values, Gideon was a great believer in regional self-government and decided that on his death, he as sole judge of Israel, which effectively meant president, would ensure that each of his 70 legitimate sons would become regional administrators. This move towards democratization and local government did not please Abimelech, either out of jealousy that he didn't get a regional post or because such a local office, if he were given one of the 70 local offices, would be beneath him. More possibly, he had megalomaniac intentions. So he killed all but one of his 70 brothers. He butchered them on a stone. And the one who escaped uh, wrote a poem, or it may have been a song, which here I'm paraphrasing. The trees decided to appoint a king to rule over them. So they asked the olive tree to be their king. But the olive tree said, what? Give up producing oil which is valued on earth and by heaven? No way. Then they asked the fig tree and it replied, what? Give up producing fruit which everyone enjoys? I don't want to be the king. And then the trees asked the vine and the vine said, no, why should I give up producing wine? I love it. No way. And then the trees asked the thorn. And the thorn replied, if you want me to be king, you'll do what I want or else. My beautiful English roses, you should not be controlled by a thorn tree which grows on the side of the Thames. I look forward to the opening of your indigenous parliament, preferably in Preston.